everyone, I'm Pamela Hastings. I hope you're really well. Welcome to another Barometer webcast. During this webcast, we will provide a review of current market and economic conditions. And as always, I, part I encourage participation from our audience. Please email me or send a message via the chat and we'd be happy to answer those questions after this webcast is completed. And I will turn the attention over to David Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hey, Pam. Thanks so much for doing this. My pleasure. Welcome, welcome everybody, uh, uh, on another weekly call. Uh, as, as is usual, there's been lots going on over the course of the past week, despite the fact that we are deep in summer. Uh, but there are lots of things to think about and lots of things to watch as they relate uh, to the markets. You know, this, this pandemic continues to march on. Uh, it is stubborn. Uh, and it is having an impact in lots of different ways and uh, many human ways and many financial ways. Uh, and we're just working at making sense of it uh, and to trying to make sure that the portfolios that we've been entrusted with are, are positioned sort of in the right way for, for what's been going on. Um, just to, to start out, as, as I think all of you know, our focus is working on behalf of families. And so I think that families have three basic expectations of their manager. The first and most important is that they expect us to use the tools that we have to try to identify the structural themes in the market that are benefiting from the current environment. Now, <clears throat> hard to imagine that that, that that is the case currently, but there are certainly some themes that have been benefiting. Uh, the world keeps changing, so we have to keep looking further afield to see what else may be going on. We need to try and recognize changing conditions uh, new leadership as it emerges and old leadership as it recedes so that we can keep the portfolio current and, and probably most important, and this is one that we are really focused on right now, our job is to play defense if required. And I think when I talk to clients, there are deep concerns about the state of the world, uh, the risks that are posed, uh, regulators, uh, central banks and governments are working hard with monetary and fiscal stimulus to, to ward off some of these dangers uh, and markets are responding. Uh, so as usual, what I'd love to do is take sort of a top down 30,000 foot view of kind of what's going on uh, and then talk a little bit about how we're using our approach to, to manage the portfolio. So uh, basic premise is that we have been in a structural bull market since 2013 when we took out the 2000 highs. We go back to 2000 actually market wasn't so so different than the one we're in now you were in a market led by growth stocks uh, growth was something that people really had a thirst for uh, and uh, some of the big names were really leading um, so we've been through a lot over the last few weeks uh, and we've tried to use our process to, to to skate our way through this as i think most of you know we have three basic pieces to the process one is a top-down model it helps us understand the environment that we're in to try to understand what there is appetite for in the market, which sectors or themes uh, or asset classes. And then second, uh, we use a bottom-up process to try to drill down through all the various things we could target for investment uh, to try to identify securities that are good getting better. And this is a really important point to make. There are people who sift through the things on the bottom, hoping that they're gonna find something that will be resuscitated that is not us. We are trying to identify a company where we can see clearly, based on the numbers, things are getting better, and where the price of the security is reflecting that view, where we, have, we know other people are interested. Now, where we can find companies that are good getting better within the structural themes that we see in market has appetite for, well, that's where our portfolio lies. And then the third piece is a very disciplined selling strategy, and that has been very important this year being able to prune the portfolio, being able to take out positions that are not working in a timely way makes an enormous difference. And that's what's got us through many, many difficult markets over time. So uh, just, just kind of quickly, um, market has been working its way higher really since 2013. Trend has been challenged a few times. We certainly challenged it in February, but very quickly back above trend. So baseline is we continue to be in a structural bull market. The waterfall decline that we saw in February and March was unmatched. There is no other uh, period of volatility that had the same magnitude or the same speed. This, this encompasses all of the bear markets going back to 1927. So we know that this was a significant, we were very happy 
to manage our way through the decline pretty effectively. And now, of course, we're in the recovery phase. So the market had an initial technical bounce off the bottom uh, in the end of March. The market consolidated a little bit. We had a second leg higher as, as governments and central banks around the world pushed liquidity into the system and put some safety nets in place for those that were displaced from an employment standpoint. Uh, and then the market consolidated. And we had a second lift higher uh, as the COVID cases started to get a little bit better. We started to understand the, the pandemic a little bit better. Uh, and we started to hear news of potential therapeutics and vaccines. And then we talked in and around June the 8th. And in many of the indices around the world, this is the high for the year so far. And since June the 8th, the market has chopped its way sideways. There's been good news, there's been bad news. There's been some very clear leadership in the market. And there's some, been some places that really have, have not been part of the rally. If we look at the Dow, it's very similar. Same thing, peaked out June the 8th. Uh, we've chopped our way sideways since then. So that's now about six weeks. Uh, and the question is, where do we go from here? Well, interestingly, you know, over the last week, we did sort of dip down below this trend that had been in place since the beginning of the rally. So we are, do have our eyes wide open. We're always looking for risks and always trying to understand, you know, what we may have to defend. We publish weekly our breadth-based models. And what I would say is now for six weeks, we have seen some weakness in breadth in the US market. In other words, the percentage of stocks participating in the rally has been narrowing. The percentage of stocks performing well globally has been narrowing. And that causes us to be a little bit more heightened from a risk control standpoint. The percent of stocks trading above their 50 day moving average in the US has been weakening. Weakened a little bit again this week. And if we were to break it into individual markets, it's a, it's a, it's a market of haves and have nots. S&P 500 acting better. NASDAQ over the last two or three weeks showing a little bit of narrowing. Uh, the um, all stocks index in the US narrowing a little bit as well. So that has implications for us in the way that we look at the world. We come at it and say, we really have to watch for any sign of weakness in the underlying themes that we're focused in. So as I mentioned, breadth for all stocks in the US has been weakening, makes us a little bit more cautious. It's had us take some profits in some of our winning positions. And it's been put us in a spot where we're a little bit hesitant to take on more risk. The NASDAQ breadth model also has, has been weakening over the last three weeks. Now this has been leadership in the market. So it's something that's important. The concept of breadth is useful because very often the very biggest companies mask what's going on underneath, underneath the surface. We know that Apple, we know that Amazon, we know that uh, Tesla have been really rocking in the market, uh, but underneath the surface, some stocks not quite so well. So we wanna watch for signs of this because the leading stocks may not tell us that. Another reason we're a little bit more cautious is that this is data that comes from loan econometrics and it looks at the number of consecutive months that the NASDAQ has outperformed the Russell 3000, which is the broad market. And we can see we've reached nine months, nine consecutive months. It's happened one other time leading into 2000. It was a good, 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 good time to have been a little bit more cautious. So we're certainly watching that. It doesn't happen very often. So this outperformance in the NASDAQ, you know, could have a breath of air. This is the NASDAQ 100. And you can see it was in a very clear uptrend off the lows from the end of March over the, about a week ago or 10 days ago, it was a Monday, 10 days ago, we've reached that uptrend. And since then, market's been chopping around a little bit. That doesn't mean there aren't great securities. It doesn't mean that there aren't lots of stocks doing exceedingly well. It doesn't mean that this can't reaccelerate. It just gives us some pause to be a little bit more cautious. So some of the big stocks, we have a big data model. Apple reports, Amazon reports, five of the biggest stocks in the market report their earnings tomorrow. And the market's gonna really care. You can see that this Apple has had a positive trend in place since the bottom. We saw a little bit of sloppiness over the last two weeks. We take that into account. Microsoft, similar. Now we've seen lots of companies report good earnings. In fact, companies have been very cautious about, about giving guidance. And so analysts have had a wide range of estimates. In general, companies have been beating. The question is, how do the stocks react to the news? 
and in some cases, good earnings have not been uh, rewarded. Other things that we've talked about over the last little while, there is a lot of speculation in the market. This is a, a chart of equity only call buying over the last 18 days. And we've reached a high we haven't seen since 2000. So that means there's lots of people buying calls, options on upside. They obviously are, are bullish. Um, that sometimes can be a contrarian indicator. What are insiders doing? We know that over the last week, the data that came out showed that for every buyer, insider buyer, there have been five insider sellers. Now the market's come back a long way. There's lots of things for people to worry about. There's lots of reasons for people to want to do some planning, but we just know that when uh, insider selling becomes significant, it's something to keep an eye on. Other things that can have an impact. We know that the market has been impacted by stimulus. The most important thing for markets are financial conditions and liquidity. There's been lots and lots of liquidity from central banks and from government governments with fiscal stimulus. But one of the most important buyers in the market over the last several years have been U.S. corporations buying back their own shares, both U.S. buybacks and non-U.S. buybacks. And we note that so far this year, for obvious reasons, companies are less willing to step in and buy their shares. It's one less buyer in the market. Okay, breadth around the world. Uh, equity breadth globally has weakened from 60% to 48%, means 48% of stocks were in uptrends. Percent of stocks trading above their 50-day moving average has weakened from 82% to 58%. Percent of stocks with upward price trajectory or upward momentum has come down from 90% to 44%. So these are things we look at underneath the surface. Not just the US, Europe has seen some deterioration in breadth. The CAC Caron is an example. The, the, the French market rallied up into declining moving averages and having difficulty in making progress. Uh, breadth in Latin America has shown some weakness over the last month. Breadth in Asia has shown some weakness over the last month, including Shanghai, India, and Japan. So there was a tremendous bounce off the bottom. The economic data definitely got better through May and June. And Fed Powell, Fed Chair Powell today noted that some of the near-term high-frequency data has started to slow and that could be some cause for concern for some companies. If we take all of the various regions around the world and put them on a distribution curve, all of the areas in pink have shown some weakness in breadth. So again, cause just to be a little more cautious, China, India, US, Europe, and so on. Okay, so what does that mean to us? The concept of breadth is an important one when, when a market goes into a correction, one by one stocks sell off led by the, the uh, the, the company's closest to a perceived problem. And eventually, if the sell-off goes on long enough, it impacts a broader and broader list of securities, ultimately companies that have nothing to do with the problem. And when you start into an advance, the leading stocks generally turn higher before the market does. And in a healthy market, one by one, companies join a rally. So that's healthy. There's no bear markets in history that ever took place while breadth was expanding. So we measure this. And we know that when breadth starts to deteriorate, it doesn't have to go on for a long time. It can reverse itself, but it means that the ice is getting a little bit thinner. We have to be a little bit more cautious. It means that we stop putting on a lot of new positions. It means that we use uh, stop losses and tighten up the stop losses we have on existing positions. We may choose to take some profits. So over the last couple of weeks, we've taken some profits. Some of our portfolios more aggressive than others. Okay, so what do we know over the last week? We know coming into earnings, expectations were very low. Analysts were very, very cautious, expecting an average 43% decline in earnings. They're expecting an 11% drop in revenues. Now that's partly because there's been very little guidance for companies. Analysts don't like to be wrong. They try to keep their estimates within the realm of possibility. And so we've had a very wide range of estimates going through this quarter. So here's what we know. So far, uh, expectation for U.S. companies has been better than for the rest of the world. That would explain why U.S. market has behaved better. So now we are sitting here partway through earnings. 203 of the 500 S&P 500 companies have reported their earnings. And yes, sales are down about 10.5%. 
earnings on average down 15%. Some sectors better, some sectors worse, some well protected, some less protected. Now the good news is that as has been the case for several quarters, in general, we're getting companies beating the estimates. So analysts have been overly cautious. Sales surprises have come in on average up 2%. Earnings expectations have come in on average 15% uh, better than the very low expectations we had coming in. The other side of the coin is how are stocks behaving? In general, they've been relatively benign. When companies have beat they aren't getting a lot of oomph. And when they miss, they're getting hurt a little bit, but the market is sort of looking beyond this quarter to think about what may be coming. Other things that have been important over the past week, we've seen the US dollar continue the decline that began in May. Now this is important because US dollar has been firm for the last number of years and it is now weakening. There's lots of reasons we could be seeing that. It could be that the COVID cases are more stubborn in the US because of the way they, things have been monitored, been, uh, been monitored uh, and dealt with. It could be that there's been such aggressive monetary stimulus, cash pushed into the system that people are worried about the debasing of the value of currency. What it means for us is that we have spent the last three months more or less hedged back to Canadian dollars. So we have been very cautious about the currency impact on portfolios we're hedged back to Canadian dollars, which are basically trading at a three month high. What else did we see? We've seen a firming up in the bond market. So long end of the US bond market has been a little bit firmer. That is people looking for a little bit of safety. We've had lots of winners. So we've talked about being focused on structural themes, themes that are benefiting from the changes taking place in the economy. So some single shot uh, situations have really had a great go. We've talked a lot about e-commerce and we've talked about Amazon, we've talked about Shopify, we've talked uh, about several companies, the, the, the payments companies, some of them have been big winners, PayPal is an example, trading in a new high today. LAM Research and the semiconductors are a big holding for us, we've talked about it quite, quite a bit. Both LAM Research and NVIDIA trading very close to highs. Semiconductors have been a very clear theme winner in the, in the move toward 5G and the Internet of Things. Electronic uh, digital design, Cadence Systems is a software company that develops electronic design automation software. Again, people doing things from home, people working by computer, work, people using tools to help accelerate the changes in their business. ResMed in the, in the medical devices area has been another winner for us. Uh, they make CPAP machines for people who have, uh, have uh, sleep apnea. Uh, a lot of medical device companies performing well. We have a fair bit of exposure here. And then in the financials, some of the ratings agencies. With all of the debt that's being issued, it all has to be rated. So whether it's MSCI uh, or S&P Global, the companies that are rating this debt or creating indices that are being used in ETFs, have also been clear winners. So lots of single shot securities acting well. We talked about gaming. Activision Blizzard has been a holding of ours as has Electronic Arts. A lot of people sitting at home playing video games. These are companies that all have been helped by the current environment. Now we really have to be targeted because there are some things that have not been working. Things like uh, utilities, things like real estate investment trusts, Things that would otherwise be seen as defensive just have not worked in the market, so it's been important to be targeted. In the consumer, uh, anybody who has been in the space uh, of internet retail, Lululemon has been a great example. They've got a wonderful uh, omni-channel uh, offering for people to buy things on the web. They've done exceedingly well, uh, and this is a group that we've been focused on. But the high dividend stocks that one might think would do well in a difficult environment really have not been there and this has been an area we've been avoiding. Now, gold. We've talked a lot about gold and precious metals. Weakness in the US dollar, that's, that's a helper. Very low interest rates as an alternative is a helper. Um, gold is exceeding, performing exceedingly well. This is a chart back to 1980. This is the bull market, a bull run from $250 to $2,000 in 2010. And since then it's been taking a rest. We went through a seven year period where gold went close to nowhere. Commodities went through a bear market 
and the first of the commodities to turn higher, remember we're looking at multiple asset classes, gold has been the first of the commodity group to really take off. And you would think, given the move that we've seen, that we should be a little bit cautious. Gold stocks have had a wonderful run off the bottom, and in fact have been the strongest part of the market beyond silver stocks. And the silver miners have, have behaved even better. So they've come a long way. And one of the questions that we're getting is, uh, is this over? Should we be taking our profits? I thought this was an interesting chart. It plots gold and silver mining companies versus gold itself. And you can see for many years, while gold was out of favor, the gold miners were even less in favor. Now that makes sense because as the price of gold falls, the gold they have in the ground, which is a lot, becomes worth less and less. On the other hand, when gold above the ground goes higher, all the gold below the ground becomes worth a lot more. And so we really have, looks like we've only seen the beginning of what could be quite a sizable move in this group. This has been an exposure that we've had across almost all of our portfolios. Uh, and, and while it only makes up two to 3% of the overall market, in our portfolios for closer to 15%, depending on the portfolio. Gold versus Dow, in other words, gold versus stocks has recently turned higher. We think it can outperform for quite some time. So we're not gold bugs, but this is an important part of a portfolio to protect us against some of the things going on in the market. This is the Canadian gold index, just breaking out of a high it hasn't seen since 2008. Other things that have happened over the week, while technology has been taking a rest, we've seen some strength in, in, in transport stocks, specifically trucking companies, logistics companies, and railroads. Consumer staples have started to perform better again. And this is an obvious one. People are going to the grocery store, they're going to fewer restaurants. Companies providing consumer staples are getting, uh, getting a, a nice uptick in revenues. And copper miners starting to follow the gold miners as the rallying commodities is starting to expand. So our job is to recognize when things are starting to change. Sometimes it means rotating our holdings from one group to another, reducing slightly, building a, building a new weighting. And these are groups that we've been focused on recently. And then the home builders and home supply companies are doing well, companies like Home Depot, companies like the suppliers like uh, Masco and, For and Bassanol. Uh, who are selling into home improvement also doing well. We all know people who have been doing work on their homes. So what does this all mean? It means that our exposures have largely been for several weeks. Technology is our largest weight across all of the various mandates and portfolios that we run. But we've reduced the weight over the last two weeks, about 10%. Materials, which have been working exceedingly well as gold companies, we expanded into silver and copper and other base metals. We've taken our exposure up here. This is a theme that has been out of favor for 10 years. Healthcare, which has led since the bottom, we reduced slightly. Biotech has slightly underperformed over the last week. And from a financial standpoint, we've taken the weight up slightly, although we continue to be still quite underweight. And this happens to be more in the area of payments companies and fintech companies than banks. Consumer discretionary has been fairly static. We've taken up our consumer staples. So things we've added. The McCormick and Company, you may know, one of the big products that they sell is spices. Turns out people are doing a lot more cooking at home. I know I'm using a lot more spices. And it may be that restaurants are not doing as much business, but much lower margin business than the, than the, than the business they're doing in the grocery store. Uh, a very consistent business, a dominant business in their space, uh, a really well-performing stock. We talked a little bit about base metals. This is the, these are the shares of Rio Tinto. Given the fact that we are in the middle of a global pandemic and an ep economic slowdown to think that this company, which is one of the biggest miners in the world with a hundred billion dollar market cap, is breaking out of a, a base that it's been in since 2012 is very significant. The last time it broke out of a significant base like this, the stock went up by 10 times in the last commodity cycle. So we have exposure here in Rio Tinto uh, in, um, in, in several other base metal companies. And then I mentioned the transports. 
the rails are performing well. We've talked a little bit about Kansas City Southern in the US. CP is the company that we bought in Canada, probably the best run railroad uh, in North America. CP is a big bulk shipper east-west, so as commodity prices go up, their business will grow. Uh, they just raised their dividend in a global pandemic. They affirmed their guidance and that they would have earnings growth this year against a major global recession. Bodes well for going forward. So how does this all boil down? Uh, our equity portfolio on the year to today is plus about 15%. We're very happy with that. The S&P total return is about 3.7%. The Dow is minus three. The TSX is minus three. And the MSCI World Index down three. In, uh, in our uh, long short portfolio, up 24% against much weaker indices. Our balanced portfolio has been at very low volatility. All of these portfolios went down sort of less than half of the market through the decline. Uh, hanging in well and doing a good job from a balanced perspective. And our income portfolio, while in a difficult camp, is doing, rel doing well relative uh, to the other mandates. Uh, high dividend payers have been underperformers. One of the big concerns investors have is will companies pay their dividend? The U.S. high dividend index is down 18% year to date. Canadian high dividend index down 16. We're down about eight and a half. Uh, certainly working our way back, but uh, down about half of the markets down. The last portfolio is the one that is our most tactical, and it's the one that we are using right now to be a little bit more cautious. We actually have been short somewhat since the market top in, in, uh, in July and June. Uh, since the market uh, went through the June 8th high, it's plus about 12% versus the S&P down about 6 uh, and this we're using as a hedge. So, as we sit, I think we continue to be in a structural bull market. We're in summer. We've had lots of good news over the last week. We had vaccine positive news. We had additional US stimulus. We had European additional stimulus. Uh, we've had a fairly dovish Fed meeting today, which the market liked. We're getting lots of news on therapeutics, but we can see that there are still some risks and we are not blind to them. Uh, if things were to get worse, we can certainly get more defensive. We will make changes in the portfolios. We have had a history of getting through declines well, uh, and if things change, we'll continue to update you. So with that, Pam, if there's any questions, uh, maybe we could open, it up, open up the lines. Thanks, Dave. So no questions right now, um, but if you do have any questions, your relationship manager or uh, David is happy to address them. Uh, so please keep them coming. Yeah, certainly uh, if we are publishing things in between these meetings. Uh, I'm posting things on Twitter at barometer.ca. If you've got any questions uh, for me directly, dburrows at barometercapital.ca. If you uh, would like any other information that we could give you, please don't hesitate to call uh, or, uh, or send us a message. And thank you for tuning oh, in. I hope you're Dave, enjoying your summer. We oh, have we have a question. question. We have a question. Um, Dave, what do you think of the current China-US relations? Look, this is one of the many, uh, many risks that the market faces. Um, we think that there's a couple of risks coming out of China. Clearly, the, the, the relationship is cooling down between the US and China. Uh, the US is not the only one. Uh, UK, has pulled back, Australia is pulling back, uh, many countries in the EU are pushing back. This is a situation that is getting worse. Um, so this is something that we have to keep an eye on. I'm not sure whether people have been following, but they are having 100 year floods in China and the Yangtze River is experiencing the worst flooding in 100 years. The Three Gorges Dam that was built in the early 1980s is at some significant risk and there are about 400 million people that live downstream from the Three Gorges Dam. So we have, while we did have some pretty good exposure to China leading up to a couple of weeks ago, we really have scaled that back. I think we have one or 2% uh, there. Look, there are risks. There are political risks. Clearly Biden is in, in the lead uh, in, the, uh, in the race for the White House. Uh, there are people who would think that he would be less economically friendly. That's, a, that's, that's something that may find its way into the market's uh, consciousness. Um, and 
and the Chinese issue is, is certainly one as well. No shortage of things to worry about. Yeah, exactly. Um, Dave, uh, one other question came through. What would be um, Barometer's outlook on Canadian REITs? We're, we continue to be cautious on REITs. The, the, probably the single, um, uh, single asset class that has helped most by falling interest rates is real estate. And uh, as real estate yields uh, go lower, it, it's easier to, to, uh, to make money in real estate, your cost of finance and getting more covered. Um, but we think that there are some risks uh, with occupancy, depending on the type of REIT, uh, and they are pretty broadly owned by the market. So this is an area we're, we're a little bit cautious on and we've been staying away from. Okay, well, thank you, Dave. I think that wraps up our questions officially. So again, if anyone has additional questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to your relationship manager or to Dave directly. Uh, you can reach uh, me at phastings at barometercapital.ca. We love having you join us every Wednesday. Uh, I believe we're going to have a, a show. I know it's a long weekend coming up, but I, I believe we're going to have a show on Wednesday. So um, stay in touch. We'll be sure to send you some topics that uh, we're going to cover in advance. And again, thanks so much for joining us and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. <laughs> My pleasure. Everybody enjoy their long weekend. Thanks, Dave.